you have to start off by, by realizing that a computer is a musical instrument that needs just as much practice as when you practice piano or the violin or the cello or whatever. You know, you have to become fairly virtuosic at programming. And I've been, look, I've been doing this for a very long time since literally sampling was invented. So I was working on 8-bit samplers and managed to get directors to feel the intention of the music behind the mock-up, which is what it's all about, right? I mean, you're supposed to go and let, you know, let them know what the piece of music is about, um, what the emotional intent is. And, you know, and we went to 12-bit samplers, then we went to, you know, 16, 24-bit samplers, then I had a stack of samplers with, you know, and I started to do my own in 94, we started to do our own samples. But it wasn't about making the music sound better or making it easier to get the job. It was just for me, because I, I didn't want to sit there all day long listening to shit sounds. You know, I wanted to um, spend all day listening to slightly better sounds. And I wanted to listen to my favorite players. Well, I mean, one of the things I did uh, back then was, I, I because sampling was um, seen by, by orchestra as sort of the enemy, and I went to all my favorite musicians in London and I said, look, here's the experiment. I'm going to try, if you let me sample you, I will make it so that directors will want more orchestral music and you will actually get more work out of it because I'm going to be able to present something where they go, wow, orchestra, orchestra is cool, right? Because it was actually a time where orchestra was thought of as not cool. And it's pretty much, actually, it worked out better than that um, because it meant that the, you know, people who started here as assistants, you know, like Harry Gregson Williams or Romain Davidi or uh, John Powell, etc., cetera, um, had access to the same tools that I had access to and could sound just as fabulous as, or whatever, as grand as my sample sounded, and then get jobs and go to go and use real orchestras to record them with. But yes, I was, I was always a good programmer. I mean, I started out as a programmer. You know, I'm a better programmer than I, I'm definitely a better programmer than I am a player. If you ask me honestly what my instrument is, I will tell you it's the computer. You need to protect the orchestras because if the orchestras go away, you know, it's going to be a huge cultural shift in a bad way. And I think the first thing you need to do is you need to r stop thinking of them in these catchphrases, the orchestra. For instance, let's just talk about strings. You need to think of the string section as individuals that come together and give you their everything and so you need to go and pick each individual player because each individual player's technique, the sound of the instrument, I mean, you know, if you go to London or if you go to Paris, if you go to Berlin, blah, 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 you know, they will have different quality instruments. They will have different sounding instruments. I mean, guitarists go mad about pickups and strings and amps, etc. You know, and that's just one guitarist. You should treat every member of the orchestra the same way, and you should treat the orchestras the same way. Um, I will write very differently stylistically here in America because I have a different room to record in with different players with different instruments than I will write for somebody in London or somebody in Paris or somebody in, in, in Vienna. Um, because just like anything, study who the individuals are that are actually going to make this performance. There are constantly reasons why music shifts, and part of it is just there are new interesting players, there are new interesting orchestras, there are new interesting spaces to record in. And it's so at the end of the day, it's not about the technology so much as opposed to there are constantly new young players that have an amazing tone that you want to capture, that you want to work with. Um, you know, look, there's like right now there's stuff coming out of Berlin or out of Iceland, 
which sounds completely different to anything that's coming out of America or out of London. And the, the sound is created by, by the individuals, and they are very different. And when I write a cello line, I know who I write it for, and literally as I program, as I write it, I see that person in front of me. So I am going to write something which is very much with them in mind. <laughs> The samples, the other thing that usually happens at the beginning of a project, once I have an idea of what I want to do, then becomes this sort of safari of sampling. You know, it's like we're hunting down sounds, we're making sounds. Um, each movie has a load of custom sounds in it. Um, you know, yeah, I work with the Spitfire guys, which, which is very helpful because they can do things. And um, there's a man in... Germany, Claudius Brüse, who um, really takes care of my samples, and he can do things that other people can't quite seem to do. I mean, he manages to, I mean, uh, phase align things and make sample, you know, make samples sound amazing. And I'm not trying to be arrogant or show off, but it's like our sampler still sounds better than other people's samplers. You know, it's, uh, and I don't know why, but it's, it's, you know. Just as I'm surrounded by talented musicians, I have talented guys in technology who are absolutely our partners in making a piece of music. I just found that the tools available at the time, you know, and of course they're a lot better now, weren't sufficient to what I was hearing in my head or what I wanted to do. So I had to get somebody in to help me build some of these things. You know, um, or make my own samples. It's it's okay. You don't have to go out and sample a huge orchestra. You know, if you if you think that's what you need to do, that's going to be really expensive. But if you if you have a rubber band and a cardboard box, and you can think of a really cool way of using that and sampling that and making a score out of that, I don't understand why people don't do why people don't make sounds more themselves why people don't really learn how their computers work, why people keep buying, and I've, I'm guilty of that, of, of buying a library and like going, uh, eh, it's a bit boring, and never actually really exploring it. That's why I'm not really going, this is a good library or this is a bad library either. It's always the guy who really knows these tools who can make amazing music with it, you know? so. To answer your question, what do you need to make great sounds? You, you need the thing that, that suits you and that you really learned.